Okay, we're going to call our meeting to order. Let the minutes reflect. All members are here. Manager Bradley is online. And we'll set the agenda. Anybody like to add or subtract the agenda today? Staff has no adjustments. No adjustments. Okay, I'll need a motion. Uh, so move, Madam Chair. Second. Motion, man, second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. And approval of the minutes. Uh, Madam Chair, I move that we approve the May 26, 2021 regular meeting of the Rice Creek Board of Managers. Second. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. Aye. And Madam Chair, I move that we approve the um, May 26, 2021 RWJD1 public hearing. Yes. Second that, Madam Chairman, but I have a question about the. We have a motion and a second. Further discussion. Yeah, is there, a, I thought I mentioned something about uh, box culverts during that hearing. And uh, the need to keep box culverts in. Actually, I remember I you did. saying that. Mm -hmm. and I, but I, I, don't I, I might have missed it here. I just uh, asked it to, you know, you, you take a look and see if there's some, for the record, because um, we're going to get into some more uh, crossing issues uh, with uh, in the future with others, and those box culverts are are an issue that I'd like to see us almost make a rule about. So, you know, have consistency because they're so so important to the productivity and the lap and and taking making sure there isn't a lot of maintenance that issue. Maybe we can discuss that with our engineers at some. Point. Yeah. yeah. So. Manager Waller, um, would you suggest adding it at perhaps line 50 on page 17 of the packet? Um, you made a comment about Hugo and. Uh, somewhere in there towards the end, it was we were talking about. It's after what I talked about. It's after about the, the JD2 one. branch one issues. Yeah. And uh, the other one. But, uh, you know, with so much of this, like what happens to us. Is how what's happening in Texas happens to us it comes around, you know, uh, when the rain doesn't stop, the monsoon comes. Those culverts are certainly yeah. an important issue, and we have them many, many places already. It's, yeah. it's not uncommon. Yeah, you know. President Brenner, mm -hmm. so, uh, I think we have to know what the language is. So, but, uh, manager, why don't you check that re recording? Uh, just handle it, bring it back to the next meeting. Is that no, how we would handle it? Otherwise, yeah. I think we need the what is the sentence that what is yeah, the sentence you'd like to have put it in? Do you want to so yeah. I would say at the end of line 52 on page 17, mm -hmm. there would be something to the effect manager Waller stated the importance of considering box culverts on public drainage systems or right. Yeah, that, that road crossing. Yeah, yeah. Like that. There you go. And that uh, it's just a uh, just a long term money saver and maintenance all the way around. Okay, so we have a motion with an addition. I accept that. Okay. Second. Okay. Any further discussion? All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay. We'll go to the consent agenda. Anything that needs to be pulled out of the consent agenda? Any further information from the staff? Yes, uh, President Priner, Board of Managers, a couple of uh, changes here um, to note. The first one I would say is for permit application 21-026 for the Fitzgerald Flats application. Um, we're having that application removed from the consent agenda. Um, the applicant is working on a, a redesign for their stormwater approach, um, utilizing a, a regional pond for water quality treatment. So we're just going through um, you know, redesign there and re-review. So we're anticipating bringing that at the next meeting. Um, and then two other just administrative changes. Uh, the first one is for application 2121. It would be on page 24 of the packet. Give everyone a moment to get there. Uh, under its administrative item number eight the last sentence to make the, the surety calculation correct. It should be the surety is based on 5,000, not 5,500. Okay. Hold on here, Patrick. 
Sure. And if you want me to share my screen, I can do that as well. Just repeat it again, please. Sure. Uh, so on page 24 of the packet, administrative item number eight, the okay. last sentence, that it says the surety is based on $5,500 for disturbance, and it should be $5,000. Ah, okay, I got it. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> and Anything then else? The yeah, there's one other change. Um, it's on page 45 of the packet. And this is for application 2142. And it's in section three for wetlands. Um, at the, the very last sentence of that section, it does have an XXX for when the notice of decision was issued. And that should be May 28th, 2021. And that'll do it, so we'll need a motion. President, mm -hmm. if I could, which, which one was pulled? I'm sorry. Uh, 026. 026. Thank you. Uh, Madam President, I move to Cap Rock permit number 21 021, 21 041, 21 042. Um, and with staff corrections. With staff corrections. Madam President, I do have one question, whether I should do it now or after you take the second. And yeah, wait a minute, we need a second. I'll second this for Motion discussion. Motion second. Okay, discussion. Yeah, Madam President uh, and staff, on page 40 for 21-041, on the second paragraph, says the applicant must denote an easement on the proposed plan of 20 feet from the top of the bank on either side of the ditch. Would that be better stated if it were on both sides of the ditch? I assume you want an easement on both sides rather than one side or the other. Manager Bradley, I'd say that's correct. Okay, I would we're propose that. It, Oh, yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Repeat it all again. I'm a little Certainly. Slow. Me too. On page 40. Yeah. It relates to 21041 under yeah. paragraph 7. Okay. The second paragraph. Yeah. The applicant must denote an easement on the proposed plans of 20 feet from top of bank on both sides of yeah. the ditch. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, any other questions? Madam President, this is Lewis Smith. Go ahead. I, I just, I'm, I'm late in, in making this point, but with Manager Bradley participating remotely, uh, the statute requires that each of our votes be by roll call. Oh, okay, so even, though it, even though it's noted that he was offsite. Okay. Correct. Okay, well, we'll, we'll just continue on that one. That's fine. Thank you. I think it's understood that all your votes before were unanimous. I've all five members voting in favor of the yeah. earlier motions, but just for our record here, I just wanted to make that note. Okay, thank you. Any other discussion? We have a motion and a second. It'll be a roll call. Okay. Manager Wynan. Your first today. Yes. Manager Bradley. Yes. Manager Waller. Yes. Manager Wagelman? Yes. And Manager Primary, yes, motion passes. Thank you. And now we go to the grant program. Any comments, questions? Lauren, anything to add today? Yeah, Madam President, I do have a question. So I okay, let me we're gonna, first. Okay, we need a motion then first. Uh, Madam President, I'll move that we the water quality grant program cost share applications uh, 21 R21-9 and W21-01 be uh, approved uh, each one not uh, R2109 not to exceed 50% up to $3,885.50 and W2101 not to exceed 50% up to $7,500. Okay. Second. A motion and a second. Discussion. Madam President, uh, Lauren, on page 50 on the last paragraph, 
Uh, we're talking about the uh, grant on uh, Bald Eagle, which, by the way, is uh, in a bay that has the worst water quality on the entire lake, so anything we can do there is, a, is good. But it says, two CAC members expressed concern about the perceived appearance of the project and suggested contracting adjacent landowners to inform them of the project. What, what's the grievance? Sure. Um, Manager Bradley, Board of Managers, uh, two CAC members um, weren't sure really what the woody material of the wave break would look like, um, which is the wave break is called a tow wood. Um, and they were concerned that it wouldn't um, look aesthetically pleasing to the neighboring landowners who have um, riprap and they thought it might be um, um, a, a concern to the neighboring landowners that um, staff should um, uh, notify the landowners of so that they're aware that the project is going in. Based on personal knowledge of that piece of property, I think anything we do to it's an improvement. <laughs> and I, I can't imagine the neighbors. First of all, it's a very small footprint on the lake uh, and some distance from anyone else's docks or anything else. So I certainly have no concerns. Uh, Madam Chair, I was the manager at that meeting and they did have a robust discussion about it. And there, uh, that and other items of uh, what is the responsibility of the watershed district to inform neighbors of any action that we are getting involved with, and how does that then impact on the watershed? I think it was very clear to the a majority of the uh, members, as well at the end agreement that. You deal with the individual landowner and it's not our responsibility to put out notices uh, to neighbors to the right or left or down the block about what we're actually doing. That was a consensus on them. That was a okay. consensus. Yep. And I, I agree that I think that's yeah. the proper thing to Go ahead. So Madam President, uh, in the past sometimes uh, wood hasn't been the best uh, protector along those shorelines. I remember uh, we put a lot of those in many years ago at Long Lake and they were called bio logs at the time. So I'm wondering if this is a, and they didn't last very long, uh, wake protection had to come in and be replaced. So the material here is what I'm wondering, uh, is this upgraded or, or because yeah, since the other folks you mentioned, they have riprap. It makes me kind of think that there's probably uh, a lot of wave action there and they'd be tough on the wood and wouldn't last as long maybe as a uh, riprap wood. Maybe learn. Maybe learn. Yeah. Respond. Sure. Manager Waller, Board of Managers, the, um, the tow wood piece of the uh, project is a temporary um, wave break to protect the native plants um, going in and to allow them time to establish um, so that they can provide long-term stabilization. And this project is in a pretty sheltered part of the lake. There isn't a significant amount of wave action. So there isn't um, a lot of concern that um, the tow wood would float away or anything like that. Um, the um, riprap and some of the adjacent um, properties, um, staff don't feel that um, there's um, a significant uh, amount of wave action in the area to warrant needing riprap on all of the shoreline in that section um, of the lake. And so um, staff and um, in the CAC um, determined that um, or uh, recommended that this project um, be approved um, as it's uh, proposed. Okay. So, so just Madam President, so, so I understand you're, you're uh, listening to you, I, I have the impression that these logs are going to, uh, are designed to be dissolved over some years or time period. Correct. And that, that the planting then it's along the shoreland is being protected by the logs as it are, um, are going to take its place and provide the, the uh, protection to the shoreland. Correct, Manager Waller. All right. 
Okay, since we're buying something that's going to be dissolvable. And Madam Chair, just to clarify, the one we're talking about is in Washington County, correct? No, no, the, no, it's in Ramsey no, County. Ramsey. Ramsey. So the Ramsey. It's County. the first one. Washington's the second. Okay. So, so my my house is uh, the second house on the easternmost point of that tip. Oh, you know that place <laughs> intimately. Yeah, okay. I know quite well. I, that place burned down after a guy at three o'clock in the morning when a guy was taking a sauna or <laughs> using his uh, sun, sun, whatever. And I think uh, they never did get paid insurance on that one. So that <laughs> lot's been vacant for about. 15 years. Ouch. You can see it's pretty odd. Okay. Most it's nine acres of swamp. Ooh. <laughs> Wetland. <laughs> no, no, Madam President, I agree with Manager Bradley. Swamp. No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anything else on this issue? Now we're gonna call for a vote. Manager Winan? Yes. Manager Bradley. Yes. Andrew Waller. Yes. Andrew Wagner. Yes. Andrew Kreiner. Yes. Motion passes. Uh, is there anybody online here for thank open you. mic? Yes. Thank you. Anybody online for open mic today? Anybody out there? Seeing none, we're going to move on to items requiring board action. Nick? Yes. President Kreiner, board managers. Next item is on page 75 of your packet. That is the letter of support uh, for the city of Forest Lake in their <laughs> state bonding efforts. Uh, you'll recall that on May 10th, um, Tim Olson and Bolton and Bank, along with uh, Forest Lake Administrator Patrick Casey, uh, joined your workshop. They, uh, uh, Forest Lake has efforts to obtain state bonding for their regional stormwater planning along Judicial Bench 4. And uh, the board by consensus said that they would support via a letter of support the Minnesota Management and Budget Office. The letter is on page 76 um, and is consistent uh, with our discussion at the workshop. I'll just note that um, we didn't include a CC line. I think that'd be appropriate to copy the city of Forest Lake, yes. then they can take it independently uh, in their materials. Madam President, yeah. um, that's an excellent suggestion. Maybe Washington County Board of Commissioners also, sure. or any of the, the senators or representatives that are, we talked about it, but the discussion, you know, we said Denver, for example, for sure. We so anyways, that's all. Yeah, question. we need a motion to have a discussion yet. Yeah. Oh, well, uh, I'll move that, uh, <laughs> that the letter for uh, uh, the city of Forest Lake stating the bonding bill uh, support be approved. I'll second it. We have a motion and a second mm -hmm. discussion. I do have one. How do we, we're, we're agreeing that we agree with the idea but we're not necessarily agreeing with whatever legislation or formal document that they're doing, proposing. So where does that come in? And maybe Lewis can answer that for me. I don't know. Or Nick. Yeah. Well, uh, President Greiner, I would say that there isn't necessarily formal legislation, mm -hmm. but rather whatever bonding is passed by the state, that okay. some of it would be earmarked, uh, earmarked for this project. Um, yeah, I guess I'll, I'll stop there because that's... Okay. Madam President, the typical, yes. if I understand your question, the, the bonding bill will make, as, as Mr. Tomczyk said, specific earmarks. So they'll identify commitments for specific projects in the legislation. Was okay. that your question? Yeah, so it doesn't matter how it's written or anything to us. We're just saying we support the idea. Correct. Correct. Okay. Oh, Madam Chair, um, um, to the point of who to copy it, I think it's a responsibility of the city of Forest Lake to make this letter uh, available to the legislators at, legislators at the appropriate time. So I'd agree the city of Forest Lake should be copied it, and possibly even the county commissioners, but going further than that is not our responsibility. Okay. Is that one for you, John? Uh, 
Uh, I prefer to have a larger list on it because we do have direct contact with those. But uh, the city of Forest Lake and the commissioners of Washington, I'll, I'll accept that limited okay. point of view. But personally, myself, I don't agree with that. Okay. But it's really not up to us to forward it out, is what you're saying. Right? Yeah. Okay, we have a motion and second. Further discussion? Hearing none, I'll call for a vote. Manja Wynan? Yes. Manja Bradley? Yes. Manja Waller? Yes. Manja Wagelin? Yes. Manja Piner? Yes. Motion passed. I'll just note for clarification, President Piner, I would say that uh, CC to the Washington County Board as a community. Yeah. Right, not just individuals. Yeah. Right. Thank you. Okay, medical leave. Nick? Yes, uh, President Breyer, board managers, next item on the agenda is the medical leave update. Uh, previously, staff had sent out a memo uh, regarding the situation, uh, along with a, a later update on a couple of matters, uh, one being the communication that the administrative communication that was sent out and then um, basically some clarity on the work of your consultant Smith partners on the matter. Uh, staff is is recommending uh, approval of an extension for the medical leave uh, based on that memo and it is open-ended, if you will, until such time that we receive information back from uh, certain parties uh, so that you can consider that to make a decision. Some further decision. Somebody like to make a motion? Uh, Madam President, I'll move that we uh, extend the uh, recommended approval of the medical extension Open ended until we receive information that's been requested of, of uh, the information that's been requested. Okay. Second. I'll second that. Okay. We got a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Uh, I just point out, Madam President, that, that uh, well, we'll have this discussion, I guess, later on. Okay. Yeah. Back. Okay. Uh, okay. We have a motion second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we're going to call for a vote. Manager Wynett? Yes. Manager Bradley? Yes. Manager Waller? Yes. Manager Wagaman? Yes. Manager Kreiner? Yes. Motion passes. Okay. Uh, let's see. Madam President, I need to approve. Uh, Excuse me, the check registered dated June 9th, 2021, in the amount of $60,651.76 prepared by Red Pack and Company. I'll second that. We have a motion and a second. Any further discussion? Hearing none, we'll call for a vote. Manager Wynant? Yes. Manager Bradley? Yes. Manager Waller? Yes. Manager Wayman? Yes. Manager Kreiner? Yes. Motion passes. Okay, items for discussion. I think Matt is over here. Yeah, so I see Matt's on our call. President Schreiner, board of managers. Matt's going to share an update on our common cup management <laughs> program. Let us know where we're at. That never, looks like he's at the North Shore today. Yes. How are you doing yes. today, Matt? <laughs> Trying to stay cool, so I used a <laughs> cool background picture there. There you go. Yeah. So, uh, Madam Chair, members of the board, I assume you can see the, the screen there that I'm sharing? Yep. Okay. Well, thank you for having me today here to prov uh, provide a mid-season update on our CARP management program. So, our spring operations, we're, we've completed our spring operations for 2021. Uh, there's a bit of a pause now before we get into our late summer operations, so a good time to provide an update. So the first few slides here are going to be um, a review from some of the last presentations that we've had to jog your memory. And then we've got some updated slides and some uh, uh, new data from this spring. And there we go. Uh, so just a reminder, what we're doing is following the adopted uh, CARP management plan. This was adopted in 2018 following the completion of the Long Lake Targeted Watershed Grant. Um, this was the deliverable or the product of uh, the grant funding that we received from the state as part of the Long Lake Target Watershed Grant. 
Uh, so we're, we've been working on uh, implementing this management plan since then. And again, the, the broad goal of this cart management effort on the Long Lake, Lino Lake chain, or really on any system, is to decrease the density of carp below the threshold where they create water quality problems. So we know that when carp are dense enough, uh, generally over 100 kilograms per hectare, uh, they're going to cause water quality problems like they've done here. Our estimate for the Long Lake Lino Chain of Lake system is, you know, almost seven times higher than what that threshold is. So there's a lot of carp in the system. They are very dense. And our goal is to try and push that density uh, down below that threshold. So we do that uh, using the management plan uh, through two strategies. One is removing adult carp. Uh, at least 50% of the population annually, and we're trying to suppress juvenile recruitment. So trapping juveniles in the uh, nursery habitat so they cannot escape. Uh, what we're really focused on kind of in the, the first part of our management plan is removal of adults. We're trying to perfect the technologies and the techniques for removals so that we can get at least 50% of the adult carp. And I, I keep using the word at least, uh, the population modeling that we've done uh, for common carp suggests that, you know, the, the, and this is not uh, uh, terribly earth shattering, I suppose, but, you know, the more, the higher percentage of the carp population that you can remove annually, the faster you're going to decrease the density down below that threshold. So we're saying at least 50%, we'd like to get more. Uh, and as we've discussed before, we're looking for tools that are effective, efficient, and reliable. So a couple of the tools, you've heard about these before, but one of them is baited box nets. These are what uh, are used in late summer. So we haven't done this yet this year, but we did do this late summer last year, and this will figure into our uh, updated numbers that I'm going to be sharing in a minute. But the way that it works is that carp love to eat cracked corn. They're the only fish species in our lakes that eat cracked corn. So when you place bait inside of a net, like we see here, it will draw them in. They'll come in to eat the corn. Uh, and then this net is designed to, to pop up uh, on all four sides and trap the carp inside the net where they can be removed. Uh, this is a picture from last year. Worked fairly well, has, and it has worked well the past few years. So this has been an effective tool, fairly efficient tool, uh, one that we can count on to, to get at least some carp every year. The other main tool that we're using to manage and remove adult carp is this low voltage Neptune system. You've heard about this, but again, that's what the box looks like. Uh, here's one of the systems being installed. Um, yep, there's one of the systems being installed. You see two rows of electrodes, so an anode and a cathode, and it generates a low voltage electric field in between those two lines. That can be used to block carp and also direct them into a trap. So we know that in the winter, the carp population mainly resides in Long Lake because it's a deep lake. Every spring, they're migrating up Rice Creek towards the shallow chain of lakes. Uh, what this system is intended to do is to block them at a certain point and then direct them into a trap for removal. So here's what it looks like overhead. Um, in this picture, this is from a couple of years ago, not this, uh, not this spring, but a couple of years ago when water was high, you actually can't see the electrodes, but it generally follows this line that you can see going across the creek here. And the carp are migrating from left to right. They encounter uh, the guidance system, the electric barrier. They swim along it because they won't swim across it. They swim along it until they swim into the trap, which we can see at the bottom of the photo. And actually, in this photo, you can kind of see a plume of sediment forming here on the left hand side of the photo that that is actually a, a large group of carp that's uh, slowly entering the trap as they're swimming upstream. Excuse me, Matt, is that yes. the footings for the bridge up or for the it, railroad crossing? It is. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Thanks. Okay. That provides some context of where we yeah. are. Uh, this is located just upstream of Long Lake in New Brighton, and yes, this is the the footings of the railroad trestle um, just upstream of Long Lake that you can see in the upper left hand uh, uh, corner of the photo. Thank you, Manager Wynant. Uh, one piece of technology that we added last year was a conveyor belt to get the fish 
out of the traps. So if you can imagine this being filled with up to five tons of carp, moving them is a challenge. And uh, one of the things we're trying to do to make this efficient is cut down on labor costs from year to year, which can be significant. Uh, so this worked fairly well. And then what we incorporated this year is uh, a, a new system from Procom. They're the same makers of the electric barrier that I just described. This would be uh, an, like an electric herding or an aggregation system. So once the fish are in the trap, moving them up towards the conveyor belt. And I've got some new photos to show you how that went this year, but here's just a schematic <laughs> generally how this system works. Uh, if, the, if the carp are migrating from left to right, so against the flow, you know, they're moving upstream, they encounter our existing ProCom barrier here. They will not swim across it. Uh, so they'll follow along the barrier until they come into the trap. Uh, what we see inside the trap here, this, this rectangular box, this is the trap. Uh, what we see inside of that are rows of electrodes, but they're off. So the fish are happy to swim in there because there is no electric field. Now they're inside the trap. Now, if you can imagine, we've got up to five tons of carp inside of this trap. How do we get them out in an efficient way? Well, this new system that we're testing out this year is intended to aggregate the fish at the downstream side of the trap, stun them, and then uh, that conveyor belt lifts them up and out of the creek. So this was tested, um, I would say, like a proof of concept test was done in 2020, but some of that work was derailed. Uh, our uh, partner from Poland, where the PROCOM system is made, wasn't able to travel to the United States last year. So we did a, a minor test last year. Things went well. This year was kind of the full-fledged test. Uh, and our partner from PROCOM uh, was able to travel here this spring, luckily. Um, so this was the system being installed this spring. Lots of wiring. Here's what the system looks like from above after it was installed. And you can already see the difference in flow condition from a couple of years ago to this year. It's been dry. Uh, so flow in Rice Creek is quite a bit lower. Uh, the orientation of the photo here is a bit different. So that railroad trestle would be just um, off the, the photo here up into the right. And then you can see uh, the electrodes here in the water. So as the fish are migrating from the top of the photo down towards the bottom of the photo, they encounter the electric barrier, they swim into the trap. You can see the yellow buoys of the new uh, electric aggregation system inside the trap. Uh, here's the I think you can just barely make out the um, conveyor belt that would carry the fish up and out of the stream. Uh, major migration in 2021, uh, lots and lots of fish at, at times, especially because of the low water level, at times it seemed like there, were, there was more carp inside the trap than there was water. Uh, there were a lot of fish migrating through this year, and this provided a, a really great uh, test for this system. You know, how do you handle five tons of carp when they're in the water stuck inside this trap? So here's uh, an aerial view from a drone when the system is being used to aggregate the fish. So the, it's supposed to push the fish from left to right towards this small channel up here, and the uh conveyor belt is just to the right of the photo i think this photo kind of speaks for itself you can see that the system worked here and it worked pretty well throughout the course of the spring um, there was lots of tests to optimize the system i think we learned a lot this year i think this the the way this system works is only going to improve over time uh procom the company actually created an automated program or app if you could call it that so at this point this is kind of press a button and the system runs itself. So once once this trap is full of carp, you can close the gate, press the button. Uh, the, the electric system aggregates the fish down into this small area where they're stunned and removed. So it's pushing them down into this small area. So another question, Matt, it looks like there's snow on the ground. So is this that May, are we talking April and May here? Oh, Manager Wine, I think this is, I think the photo um, is probably, this is not snow. This is probably dead reed canary grass on the ground here. Okay, I think so when, photo, we're, yeah. when were you doing this? What? 
Yes, was Manager the, Wynan, thank you. The, the operation started this year a bit early. We had, if you recall, we had very warm weather in late March. Uh -huh. Actually, was it even late February? It started early this year. Uh, I think it's in earnest. It, uh, the migration started in March. March. So in in years past, we have started operations with snow on the ground. This is not snow here, um, okay. but the, the migration can start very early, uh, as early as as early March. Um, I'll talk. Thank you for bringing that up there. I'll talk more about uh, some challenges we had with the the season and the weather this year. But generally speaking, these operations run from anywhere from March to May, and we're generally looking at about a one month window. That's what we're assuming the migration, how long the migration will last and how long these operations will go. Mm -hmm. so thanks for the question. Uh, here's what this small enclosure looks like once the fish have been herded into it. And these, these pictures kind of speak for themselves again. Uh, so the fish are stunned, and then we're using a jet of water to kind of push the stunned fish up onto this conveyor belt. Uh, but the system worked quite well. The system worked quite well in aggregating the fish down into this small area. Again, took some uh, trial and error, some practice figuring out the right settings uh, for the system to ensure that uh, the fish aggregate properly into that small area, but generally it worked well. So here's the system kind of in action then. The fish are moving up and out of the conveyor belt. Uh, they're going into tubs to be euthanized, uh, then moved by very large bags onto trucks and hauled out. Uh, you know, we always get the question, what are what is being done with them? They're going to farmer's fields uh, as fertilizer. The permit that we have from the DNR stipulates that, the, and this is actual words from the permit, the fish can be buried or burned. Or buried or incinerated. These fish are being uh, buried in a farmer's field so they become fertilizer. So here is our rundown of how operations have been going, our mid-season summary here. Uh, our, our most recent carp population estimate, this came from last year. This will be updated, this population estimate will be updated uh, again later this year. Uh, but our most recent population estimate from last year is around 34,000 carp. Um, that's a lot. This, there's some error bars on this population estimate, but that's a, a good estimate. And our annual goal is to remove at least 50% of that population. So uh, simple arithmetic here for starting with that number. We removed just shy of 7,000 last year with that box netting. I showed you those photos of the box net with the corn. Uh, so subtracting those this year, uh, over 10,000 carp were removed in the spring migration. Um, quite happy with that. I think uh, Carp Solutions is seeing even a bigger uh, opportunity here in future years. They think like we could do even better than this. But I think for the first year with all of the equipment being in place and running as it should, this was a good number. And with those two operations, we have already surpassed our annual goal of removing 50%. So we're feeling good about that. Uh, there, there is remaining work for 2021. Uh, so we do late summer box netting. We have budget left to do that. This is a guess here, you know, 4,000. Last year, we got just shy of 7,000. But as the population decreases, this is a, an important thing to consider. As the population decreases, then we're knocking this number down from 34,000. You know, we have to stay flexible with the tools that we're using. Some tools like the box netting, which we're going to be doing later this year, probably are going, the, the efficacy is probably going to decrease simply because there's less carp in the system. Um, we can probably expect to, to capture a few less every year or a smaller portion of the population. So this is a guess. But let's say we hit this target 4,000. That's putting us at over 60% 60 per, 60 removed. And I'm my thought is that if we can exceed 60% removal on an annual basis, we're going to be pushing down toward our uh, density goal in a, in a fairly short number of years. So feeling good about that. Uh, what worked this year? So the Procom Neptune barrier continues to work well. We've been very happy with the way that barrier is working. Um, it does require maintenance uh, from year to year. Uh, will require some significant maintenance next year, but we know about that. We plan for that. We budget that. 
we're very happy with the way that it's working. The new aggregation system that we used this year, likewise, we're very happy with the way that that worked, uh, especially with this being the first year that it's being used. Um, I think it worked quite well, and I think we can only improve the way that we're using it in the future. Um, CARP Solutions is the primary vendor who helps us with a lot of these operations. Um, they've proved to be very dedicated, um, working very hard on the site, often in pretty awful conditions. Um, I think we're really happy with the work that they've done for us. Now, some of the challenges this year, uh, Manager Wyman, you brought up some questions uh, about the weather and when we start this. Uh, so this year we had kind of a strange weather pattern where we started out with really warm weather in March, and then we had that cold snap for a long period of time uh, all the way into early May. I think that we were setting some records for, for uh, low temperatures, and then it warmed up again in late May. So what this did was it kind of interrupted the carp migration. They, the carp started moving early, and then they stopped for you know a month or more, uh, and then the, the migration started again. So what this did uh, was elongated our spring timeline. Um, now, because all of the equipment worked well, we were able to hold the migrating carp at bay until we were able to get to them later in the spring when things did warm up. But the issue here, the challenge here, is when you elongate that timeline, it stresses the budget a bit. Uh, but uh, not a, a deal breaker. We still got at our numbers this year. Uh, we also had really dry weather this year. I showed you some of those photos. Here's a couple more. Um, this is unusual low flow. I mean, up to two feet lower uh, than what we see typically in the spring through Rice Creek. Um, so this kind of changed the flow patterns through the system, um, made it, I think the carp were sometimes reluctant to swim into the trap because we had such low water, maybe they felt exposed. Um, the electrodes, which you can see here on the right, were generally exposed and yet still worked well because the bits of pipe that were under the water are still generating the electric field. Uh, so some challenges there, but um, again, the system still worked well. Um, carp solutions had to make several modifications to the trap area during the spring season to account for this low water levels, you know, resetting equipment, um, some backbreaking muddy work there that they had to do. Uh, we also have ongoing problems with security and vandalism at the site. Uh, if you recall, we installed a temporary security fence around the site. Um, I think it was two years ago. Um, I think this summer we're going to be looking to uh, uh, change this into a more permanent security offense. We need to work with Ramsey County, the landowner, on getting that done. Uh, but we continually have problems with people getting into the site, breaking things. Um, one of the, I mean, obviously the biggest concern is public safety. We have signs up to keep people away, but still they come in. Um, probably second on the list of concerns is we have an emergency shutoff switch for the barrier, which should be there. Um, but it's a big red button. People like to sneak in and press it to find out what happens. And what happens is the car population then moves through the site and effectually, uh, effect, effectively shuts down our spring operations. So we saw some signs of vandalism early this spring. Uh, one part of the fence was knocked down uh, earlier in the year. To combat that this year, we actually hired a security company to provide on-site security uh, for a little over a month at the site. That that shut down all issues with security. We didn't have any more problems at the site after that, but that was an unknown expense. That stressed our budget a little bit. And I think in the future, we need to come up with uh, more efficient strategies for securing this site, uh, keeping it safe, and keeping everything working as it should. Um, so last thing I mentioned, uh, the budget. Uh, right now, we're actually, I, I put in slightly, we're projecting slightly over. I just checked it again late yesterday. I think we're on track to come in right around the budget number this year. Uh, the past few years, we've been way under budget, so there's been some money that's been going into our fund balance uh, the past few years. It's possible we'll go slightly over in 2021, but not by a lot if that happens. So, uh, members of the board, I feel like I've been talking uh, straight for a long time there. I appreciate the couple questions uh, interspersed in in the presentation, but happy to answer any other questions you have now. Manager Wallen. Matt, how many years have we been doing this? 
Integer Waller, I would say this is probably our, well, um, things okay. probably started, we started way back in 2013 or 14, beginning to study the site with the U of M. Um, right. So seven years uh, by that, but, you know, in full earnest working to remove CARP from the system, I'd say this is our third year. And, and we had, uh, before they, we worked with the university, didn't we just have some netting deals that were done in the winter? We did those for a couple of years too? Manager Walla, correct, yes. Yep, started out so, working with the University of Minnesota, studying the system, uh, doing winter removals, yes. Well, it seems to me it's been a, a very good program. And uh, I have a question now. Uh, we know where the railroad bridge is, so is that pond that we're looking at, uh, the sediment pond? Yes. Uh, Manager Waller, right. yes, it so, is. So, uh, one of your very early photos that showed that the water is low and the sediment pond is is working well. It seems to have accumulated a lot of sediment in it. Uh, is there any way that uh, the sediment pond, who technically owns that, Matt? Is that Ramsey County's property or is that the watershed? Is that a watershed facility? Manager Waller, it is a watershed district facility uh, as it is a public water. I'm actually not sure who the, what the parcel ownership is. I know the parcel ownership around it is Ramsey County. Uh, okay. But technically, you know, all of this water is a public water. It is a district facility. So the reason I ask is maybe this is a permanent site because we've had this, the electrodes and other places on the, on the system near, near this area. But maybe this particular pond and this site could be a permanent site providing security in the if you have a permanent site of it and you can put in more permanent fencing and such that, that's what i'm getting at here uh, i'll uh, i'll wait for you, for you guys to do a little more study on that and, but uh, that seemed to me it's an appropriate place to uh, put up a permanent uh trap facility manager waller i absolutely agree you know we've we've taken this program kind of step by step ensuring that uh, this is the site that we want long term, that things are working at the site, that we have a good relationship with Ramsey County. <clears throat> As we're checking those boxes, I think we're becoming more and more convinced that this can be a permanent site and things are working well here. And yes, we can build out more permanent uh, security features and, um, you know, for lack of a better term, make this look nicer or more of a permanent site. It still has kind of a, um, a test site look to it. Well, and then, uh, of course, you have to be conscious that we're going to come in there every so many years and remove that sediment so that you have plenty of water to catch carp with yes. in dry times. Yes, good point. So uh, that just added Manager Waller to my list of questions for Matt. So let me give them to you and you can I'm take so, them in I'm, any order. I'm sorry, Matt. <laughs> um, so that's an artificial uh, expansion of the creek system there, as you're talking about a sediment plant. So you can just plant a sediment pond. Um, I am wondering why Poland is interested in U.S. carp, and when this late, when the late uh, season extraction happens, and is this a clean? Is this Clean water funds, or is this through like uh, Lassard funds, or how, how are we paying for this? What's General tax dollars. Okay, so we don't have any state dollars to do this. We did. We did. We did. We did. Okay. Yeah. Well, we did. Okay. So we'll, So that's what I got. Sure. And yeah, I, I mean, walked that path often, so I'm familiar with what you're talking about. So, okay. Uh, Manager Winant, uh, to the to the funds question first, um, the program when it initially kicked off, it was, uh, I would say, cost share funding, or we we split some of the funding between the University of Minnesota, and mm -hmm. then as the program was expanding and turning into more of a long term management program, we had the Long Lake Targeted Watershed Grant to help us pay for a lot of the infrastructure, like the Procom system. Um, a lot of the data collection, the development of the long term management plan. Um, so that was the development phase and the product of the Long Lake Targeted Watershed Grant. That was um, 
clean water legacy dollars was the management plan and some of the infrastructure that we use at the site. Now that we're in long term management mode, the funding is Rice Creek Watershed District ad valorem funding. Um, to your question about the late season uh, trapping, the, the box netting, that's typically done August and September. That's when carp are returning from the Lionel Lake chain of lake system back down to Long Lake for the winter. Um, so that's when the population is at the highest in Long Lake and trapping generally goes well at that time. So that's that's when we would expect it again this year, August, September time frame. Uh, and then your first question was about Poland and their involvement. Uh, so when we initially started this program, um, well, I should say that electric fish barriers are not new. There, there's been electronic fish barriers for many years. Uh, we did some research in-house, that is to say I did. There, there really are only a couple of vendors around the world that manufacture electric barrier systems for fish. One of them is in the United States, uh, in the Pacific Northwest, that is Smith Root. Uh, and then Procom, based out of Poland, is another. Uh, what we wanted at this site was a unique system, not something that is typically used in the United States. It's low voltage, so it's not intended to stun the fish. That makes it safer. Uh, we also like the fact that, as you can see with the electrodes here, they're mounted on the bottom of the channel and they float up, well, when water levels are higher, they would float upwards uh, with the buoys here. What that means is that they don't uh, accumulate and capture um, debris, sticks, uh, cattails, other things that are coming down from upstream. That unique design, uh, not done by Smith Root, not done by any other company, Procom was the one that did it. So we started working with them. Started slowly testing things, building the program, and it's turned into a good relationship and worked well. Um, they're not interested in taking any of the fish, anything like that. They're just the manufacturer of the equipment that we use on site. But you don't find out. <laughs> and we have a fish barrier in Bald Eagle Lake, too. Do we have some? Yeah, it's, a, it's for ditch number one to prevent them to go up into the Schumann Marsh right. which has been flooded uh, and uh, that would be a very good uh, grounds for the environment for those ships uh, right. uh, to reproduce and so we're trying to keep that out. And that's a mechanical thing. No, that's just, yeah, it's a mechanical. Physical, right. physical, 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 not physical. Yeah, no, it's just okay. a physical barrier. Like the Pro Bar Hotel. Yeah, okay. I got it. Thank you. President Breger, uh, board of managers, uh, Matt, could you uh, make a statement in regards to a game fish just to clarify how any game fish might be handled at, at getting uh, ensnared in this uh, situation? Yep. Thanks, Nick. Good question. Um, one that we get uh, often from people walking by when they see all of the fish. Uh, Generally, when these carp are migrating, there's not a lot of other game fish that are migrating with them. Northern pike migrate earlier than carp do. Um, we do see some, towards the end of the carp migration run, we do see some bass, occasionally a walleye uh, coming out of Long Lake. Um, whatever game fish, or I'm sorry, whatever pan fish might be migrating out of Long Lake are dorsally compressed. You know, they're flat up and down, so they could actually just fit right through this trap and we never see them. Uh, but when we do, uh, on, the, on the rare occasion that we capture a northern pike or a walleye or a bass inside of this trap, they're simply sorted out and placed back in the creek on the other side. Uh, so the, the whole system is intended to be non-lethal. Uh, Matt, then also, could you, you mentioned the big red button and, and people pushing it uh, for their own interests, I'll say. Um, how are you, are you alerted to that? Is there some kind of interface with uh, your cell phone or is it just a matter of coming out to the site daily to ensure its uh, security? Yeah, Nick, thank you for the question. I hadn't mentioned that. Uh, new this year, um, well, and I don't think I mentioned this earlier, so thanks for bringing this up. Um, the system, the the electric barrier, which is what we see in the lower right hand photo here, 
is running continuously throughout the spring season. Um, so it's holding those carp back uh, and then directing them into the trap. Um, it doesn't run other times of the year. Our partners from Poland, the company Procom, obviously they're not here throughout that entire time. But if, setting need, if settings on the barrier need to be changed, they can adjust the power going into the barrier. There's lots of other adjustments that can be made, the wavelength and the frequency of the electricity in the barrier. They can make those remotely because there is a modem installed in the system that runs on the Verizon wireless network. So they can actually access the barrier, check the settings from anywhere. Um, so it's interesting sometimes you know, trying to text them <laughs> or, or send some kind of message late in the day when you know it's 11 o'clock at night, but they still respond uh, and they can check, uh, you know, 11 o'clock at night in Poland when it's whatever time here, but they can still respond and change the settings on the barrier. And then new this year, Nick, to your question, um, if power is lost to the barrier, uh, the system will actually send out text messages saying the power has gone down. So my phone will light up with a message if the power is lost to the system, including if that emergency shutoff switch uh, goes down. Now that allows somebody, either myself or somebody from CARP Solutions to rush out to the site and restore power to the barrier. Um, but if that's for any significant period of time, eight or 10 or 12 hours, you know, a big portion of the population can move past the barrier in that time. So well, it's it's an improvement. You know, now we know if the power goes down, um, security from vandalism, keeping people on the side is still a concern. What one more? Uh, just the the productivity. I'll say must be exciting. So I'm just kind of curious. Uh, what's the biggest carp you ever saw come through, <laughs> or that kind of thing? Oh, I had uh, oh. Nick. I'd have to ask them this year. I know we've seen some over 800 millimeters, which, um, you know, is in the 15 to 20 pound range. But interestingly, the Long Lake system, um, there's, a, there's a fairly high natural mortality rate. So we do occasionally see very large carp, but not, not typically the 20 pounders that people talk about in some other lakes. Um, because the system... The, the, the population is so dynamic, we tend to see a lot of smaller carp, and that's not a good thing. That means that reproduction is happening uh, frequently. Uh, so yeah, we do occasionally see the 10 to 15 pounder, uh, and we saw a few of those this year, yeah. Thank you. Anything else for Matt? Very good, Matt, thank you. Yeah. Thank okay, you. Uh, I I want to take one minute. I saw somebody come in online or by phone, I believe, and I don't know if they were here that they wanted to be an open mic, if they want to identify themselves or. I think it's Mike. That's when he switched. Yeah, Mike, is that you? Yes, it is. Okay, yeah. just want to make sure. Thank you. Okay. Good catch. Uh, district engineers, state and timeline. Anything particular, Chris? Um, Madam President, no, I don't have anything to note, but certainly can uh, address any questions you may have. Any questions for Chris today? Nope. Hearing none, we'll go to the administrator updates. Yes, President Pryor. <clears throat> Board managers, tonight we have an Oak County Ditch 10-22-32 public hearing. Just to note, uh, we have the uh, past special workshop on organizational development. Uh, we just uh, in the final stages regarding the new description for public drainage and facilities and i'll be looking to bring that to the board um, we did enter into a contract for the rest of the job descriptions to bring them into alignment with the watershed management plan and uh, staff have uh, communicated with uh, Slinsky's. I believe I'm pronouncing that correctly, our, our violation, and offered some dates, and we are awaiting their response. So we're on our way. Good. Good. Any questions for Nick? Hearing none, we'll go to the administrator updates. Uh, Marcy. Um, I just have a question about tonight's hearing. First okay. of all, I'll, I'll be online okay. about it. This is this is just to add additional or updated information that the engineer has received, including those um, 
pipeline process? Is that President Friday, uh, the, the meeting tonight is a public hearing on the records uh, correction, which is to say, uh, we also associate the term basic that has constructed oh, subsequently okay. in yeah. condition. So with additional information, uh, this, the northern part, uh, or the, I'll say the headwaters of ACD 102232 mm -hmm. uh, was previously referenced on a functional profile. Uh, we have additional sampling from the, the repair work and maintenance that we've done in the area, and we're now applying that information to be definitive uh, in our efforts for that ASIC, or what was the historic construction of the dip. That then informs all our future maintenance uh, and repair of the system. Okay. So, Mr. Otter, this has anything to add to that, but I, I believe that covers it. I think uh, you covered it very well there, Nick. Um, again, the, the, as Nick indicated, it, the information that we have gathered um, since the prior proceedings on the system uh, has mostly been uh, that area north of Pine Street, so that's where the focus of this um, proceeding that we'll be doing tonight is the area north of Pine Street. Okay. And I have pictures of that in some recent meeting we had. Yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, uh, yeah. President Prime, <laughs> Prime Minister, I believe you're referring to when uh, Houston Engineering brought the uh, amended uh, technical memo uh, yes. back to, uh, to the board uh, for its consideration and to set up the public hearing. So. And that's when we were alerted to the pipelines that were exposed. Correct. I'm thinking that, about the right yeah. pitch. Yep. Yep. yep, yep, that was okay. part of it. Yes. Okay. We do have pipeline crossings in, on other systems as well, but yes, it this is notable good. in this area, most definitely. Okay, thank you. Manager Bradley, any updates, please? I have nothing to add. Thank you, Manager Waller. Nothing. Manager Wagman. Uh, I have nothing either. All right, and I have nothing new, so we need a motion to adjourn. With that. So moved. Second. Motion made and second. Any further discussion? Call a vote. Marcy? Yes. Manager Bragg? Yes. Manager Waller? Yes. Manager Wagaman? Yes. Manager Finer? Yes. We are adjourned. See everybody tonight. That cartwheel is cool. It is cool. <laughs>